It's 11 18 p.m. I know I said I was going to bed. I just couldn't leave well enough alone. I started tracing CPUs. The whole this side is traced out. I'm thinking I might have a blown 745 on the logic. So anything I think of 745, 745. Hey, hell my goober. It's 11 46 p.m. Every single pin on that CPU checks out. All the lines are there. So it's either a 745 that's screwed up or one of the custom chips. Yelling and screaming upstairs is the kid. Mona and the dog. Look, look at all these pins. They're all, they're literally crushed in. I don't know if you can really tell. They're pushed back. Therefore, not making contact. It's 12.06 a.m. It's the next day. I put a shirt on over my other shirt. This one's got cat hair all over it. Agnes socket, you can tell it's just, it's just messed up. I don't know if that's the cause. It's probably one of the 74 logic chips there you go so if your hole's not uh, good and open uh, the solder won't suck very well old agnes socket removed everything came out clean a couple solder blobs i have to wick out mainly on the grounds i'm gonna show you how i do a rom socket i grab it and i crack it and then i crack the middle And just literally break the socket. The idea is you want to pull the pin, the plastic, off of the pins, and then you can just heat them up and pull them right out. All right. So I've smashed up the socket with pliers. And I just pull this off, see? And you see how you have the metal left here? Let me zoom in a little bit. Yep. See, so you have all the metal left right here, and literally touch the pad. There it is. And then just repeat that process. So as you can see, it's pulling them out and then I just, I'll goop it and braid it and then this will all be smooth and holes are clean, no damage front or top or bottom and uh, I'm going to repeat the process on the other side. Here is our cleaned up sockets. We have uh, Fat Agnes here, aka the Fat Lady. And so your Agnes and this is the ROM socket. You can tell it came out nice and clean, front and back. So right here, right here, no via, via's lost. I almost forgot, it's 153. How about I go over? Here are some replacement PLCC Agnes sockets. They're in brown. I think it's silver again. That's some old stuff too, boy. That's some old stuff. Radio Shack 6040. Rom and Agnes socket. The second Agnes the user shipped has a broken pin. So how do I know what to scope? I'm using um, the Sprint Layout Viewer with the Amiga 2000 files. And I'm just following the standard reset bus, all the IPLs off the CPU. You can get the 68,000... You can get the 68,000 printout, like when I got this one, and it tells you exactly what lines are what, all the Ds, all the VCCs, your NITs, your VMA, your halt ground clocks, and you probe on these, and that's, there's a standard priority or order that the Amiga takes in order to do its reset, and the colors that you see on the screen, they're all part of a self-test mechanism, and basically a boot process and by going through each one of those usually off of these and the other chips is how you kind of start your troubleshooting process and that's at least what I do other people might do other things just because you've done a hundred of them you know exactly what to look for with battery damaged Amiga 2000s usually it's around the VCC bus the RTC the CPU socket or even the ROM can be but this one being the Titanic was soaked with some kind of salty nastiness all in the back on the video. Well, the video section looked like it was just drugged from the bottom of the sea. So after a massive cleanup on the internal pins, all the ferrite beads were, like, rusted. How do you rust a ferrite bead? They're like, I don't know. Anyway, I got those all fiberglass pen. They're all shiny again. And all of the pull-ups and the EMI filter capacitors, they're all okay. I went underneath the board and it took forever. 
just testing. When you get a hunch, you start testing on something else and testing on something else. So that's kind of my troubleshooting process. We're zapping in a uh, new resistor and ceramic. It just gets so bad. These are NTEs is the ones I'm using. So we have a little bit of a boopy solder right here for me. A new resistor, a new ceramic capacitor, and a new cap. Another thing that's been asked of me is this monitor. People are like, hey, you're always using this DB23 to SCART converter into HDMI. Does your Dell actually do 15 kilohertz? I will show you this time. We'll use the... Now, because this is a VGA uh, monitor, of course, you're going to need to use the Commodore uh, RGB to the VGA thing. But we'll do that. This cable's a little long, so I'll have to just fish it around here. If this works. EGA on the monitor, it defaults to that when I turn it on. And new caps, new this, new that. Let's see if we get past our white screen. Here we go. Whoops, get all the crap off of it. White screen, come on baby. Come on baby. Bingo! Hot dog! I told you it would be it. So, thank you, oscilloscope. Thank you. Sure. Warming the living room up. No! I had to cut that because my GOO GLE box decided it was going to turn the living room temperature up. So, what do we got? Uh, thanks to the uh, Sprint layout viewer and the Amiga 2000 files that let me find this resistor, this cap, and this uh other cap right on paul on the vcc bus trust me it wasn't easy to find that i had to bust out the oscilloscope now i'm not done with this titanic what's left sorry uh i have to do the audio ports i'm gonna put a battery in it and i have to solder mask off the uh vcc bus right here because that's 12 volts live i'm tired it's been all weekend again fixing Amigas. Well, that's what I like to do. It's amazing. These things can really take a beating. Commodore didn't plan for these to run more than five years. Here we are, 30-something years later. We're still doing it. We're, still We're back in action. Got a replacement battery. You know, I don't have replacement parts for everything. Considering I do this for free. Minus shipping. Here's your ports in the back. So, here is a photo so here is now, and then I'll show you a photo right now of what it looked like when I first got it. Oh, real quick. So here's this. Here's the back. You can see we're all clean again. I'll show you some photos of when I first got the unit. So if you go and you plug a mouse into your Amiga, while it's running, at least the Amiga 2000, you're going to pop... F1. What is F1? It's a green little fuse right down here that's supposed to be 5 volts and she's zero. Damn it, Jim! I have fuses. Bend our legs in advance. That goes in there like that. Liquid love. Bip. And just like that. We'll have a mouse again. I'm going to ground out here and test the second pin from the left side on the bottom, which is pin 7. You can see right there it's got 5 volts on the multimeter. And same with port 1. So 0 and 1. This is your mouse. This is your gamepad joystick. Now what will happen is the keyboard's going to function fine. The mouse will click, but it won't move. And we'll, we'll double test that now. So I'm going to hook a keyboard up, and I'm also going to hook a gamepad up. This is just my Sega Master System joystick that I always use. So, mouse, I have left and right movement, but I have no movement. The mouse cursor is right there. Um, you'll see right here, button 1, button 2, 
up and left are the same and right and down are currently grounded which leads me to believe it is not a fuse, it is not a CIA what could it be? it's a little 74 LS logic chip this puppy right here is U, what is it, 202 I think so this takes your mouse movement inputs and joystick inputs and does some science and makes them work. Now because this was the Titanic and all of this was like a salt crust rust mess I'm going to go over the pins from the bottom. I'll just test all the continuity to its corresponding EMI filter caps and the ports. Just Hello to make and welcome back to the Titanic. Uh, I've been waiting about a week for parts to come in, specifically the LS157. LS157 is a two to one multiplexer. What is a multiplexer? It takes your input, doubles it, does some science, shoots it up, mouse works. I have traced all the connections on the mouse to the Paula and the Denise and the CIAs, your mom, which leads me only to this part. But thanks to the wonderful John Graham who runs a store on eBay called, and I have used him several times in the past, Specialty Parts Inc. There's a store QR code. Feel free to scan that. He sells like everything. Here's the official part number of what it is and what I paid. Let's get this truck rolling. There we go. So there's our chip removed. Now what I'm going to do is heat each individual pad up so I'm going to try my best to do this so you can see it. I'm going to heat this pad. And pull it out. There we go. And I'm just going to repeat that over and over. And they all should come right out nice and easy. And then I'll braid the holes. up my flux here and I'm going to re-solder this but this gives me also another opportunity to check traces so that is the new chip and so I'll take a cap off get a dip always use your spouse's toothbrush that way you don't have to use your own give her a scrub and we're going to put in my workbench 3.1 ROM prototype that was from my Amiga 2000 my actual 2000. This is my real prototype room. Mouse is hooked into port 1. I do not have a keyboard. Click the button. Power supply is firing up. This should beep because the gen this thing will come on. Perfect. We should have a kickstart screen because the Amiga did work. Floppies. Alright, there's our kickstart 3.1 screen. I'm going to insert this ADF which should be still on sysinfo and this should fix the mouse. It should fix the mouse. There's nothing else that 157 is the only chip. Okay, ready? Bingo. We got mouse, baby. Whew, mouse. Yeah, we can move the mouse again. So that was a weird weird uh, mouse. So you can pl I put it on joysticks so you can see the movements. Now, I don't know if you saw whoops, this before. When I did this, these two buttons were like stuck. And that's what led me to think of the 157. This drive is going to be noisy. And it may or may not work. Hard drive is spinning. I'm going to boot this off of Workbench. The idea is just to see if the Zorro bus is working. It's the last thing I have to test. Well, there you go. There's another problem. Now the repair is not over. I tried an Alpha Data Multiphase 3 car. This is a... Uh, high-speed serial I.O. I'm going to scope out some CPU bus lines to the Zorro slots because the Titanic, you know, she was sunk nuts deep. And, uh, yeah, we're not done. It's 9.01 p.m. Hello from several weeks in the future. Like my shirt. Ironic, huh? Got here a package in my hand from the old e-booger. 
We got some 745, 74LS 245s to replace. Mainly, we're going after U604 and U603 are quad octal buffers with three inputs. Yeah, what does that mean? So here's the data sheet on a 74LS245. They are octal bus transceivers with three state outputs. What does that mean? That means for the Amiga, CPU resources can go one of three ways. They can go towards the Zorro bus, from the Zorro bus, or nowhere. Three states. But what I'm going to do is there is a resistor pack soldered to the side of each one. That's fun. I'm going to go braid city here and we're going to remove. So there's our chip soaked with flux. So now you can see we have a socket and the resistor will have to go on the bottom. I'll solder on the bottom. The idea of that is I don't have to worry about that resistor pack anymore on the top. A nice socketed but I would not recommend using heat on a 30 year old board due to risk of delamination. I don't know if I can even show this, but this is a piece of fiberglass basically. There's a layer on the top, there's a layer on the bottom, the circuits run through it. Bob's your uncle. If you heat that up, it can go like this, and the heat will spread, and you can have a runaway and lift more traces than you can imagine. That's why I don't use heat. I would rather take a 280 degree Fahrenheit uh, soldering uh, iron and use a half a roll of braid versus risking getting that out. Boom. Two resistor packs. There we go. Two brand new chips. I'm going to show you what it's supposed to look like. Now you're seeing I slowed it way down so I could get this in real time. All right. Here we go. I'm going to go down the B side. Normal. Normal. The brakes are me lifting, right? This is the new chip. Okay, here's the other side, the A side. Sorry. Heads in the way. I might cross the streams when I do this. Okay. You see how that, all the pins are fine? Watch this one. Look at that. Look how tiny it is. Didn't touch the zoom. There's nothing on this chip. That one's got it. Oops, across the streams. Damn it. U600 is pooed out. I want to test the other ones first. I got two bottom ones replaced. I should just do them all and say hell with it, but this board had such damage. Thanks, oscilloscope. 85 degrees on a working chip. 107 and climbing. 108. 109, the chip in here in the front, 80, 83, this one in the back, 110, so you think I found the bad one, 113, holy crap, ta-da, this unit is now repaired, that's cool, so I'm going to wrap this up, and it's done, Three weeks this took me, two of which I was waiting on freaking parts. I'm going to put new audio uh, ports on it that I don't have and that are on order. So I'm probably going to wait another week for those. And uh, we're good. Water does weird things to computers. That's going to wrap this section of this video up. What I am going to do is contact the owner and let them know that things are now groovy and everything is back in Amiga world. So yet another Amiga 2000 has been fully saved and if there's any weird crap with the audio I'll make a video on it and share what my experiences are so thank you guys for watching and as always I hope you learned something